Um, the, I'm Andy, as he said. Um, you can find me on andy-cast.com and on Twitter at DrMacNinja. <coughs> um, so the browser will be 30 years old next year. That'll be when the 30 years since the first release of a web browser. Um, so I'm going to try and compact as uh, much of the history in as I can, because obviously there's a lot, a lot of it. Um, but the story begins in the year 1990, over in Cern in Switzerland, where Tim Berners-Lee, um, just get us to respond. Yep, Tim Berners-Lee um, created the World Wide Web. Um, part of that was the introduced um, the first web server, first uh, web page and the first web browser. Now this first web browser he called World Wide Web, which was all one word to distinguish it from the World Wide Web, uh, confusingly. Um, he later acknowledged that this wasn't that obvious, so renamed it Nexus. Um, and this uh, here is a screenshot of what that first browser would have looked like. This image is taken from the CERN website. Um, so you can see it's all uh, grayscale. This was actually how the browser work looked because it only ran on a next uh, computer, which was the computer that Tim Berners-Lee used at CERN. And a limitation of that machine was that it was uh, only in grayscale. So uh, the first browser was pretty basic. It did do some, um, it did text and it could do some <coughs> style things, but the styles were defined by the software rather than by the actual web page. Um, yeah, it was pretty basic compared to modern um, modern browsers. The one thing it did do was you could actually not only browse web pages with it, you could edit them as well. Because Tim's view um, vision for the World Wide Web was something that was very collaborative. So people would not only consume information but they contribute back to it. So this was um, all started off at CERN. So in the years that follow, um, the World Wide Web would grow as a concept, but primarily amongst the international scientific community, mainly amongst physics research institutes and university, um, university science departments. As a result of that, a number of new browsers would emerge, but all for specific platforms, because the different universities and institutions, they all had different machines that they were working with. So there was quite a lot of diversity across um, web browsers. It wasn't until 1993 that things started to change because the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, the NCSA at the University of Illinois released Mosaic. Now, Mosaic introduced a number of new features um, to a web browser. It brought in the concept of bookmarks, web history, and most importantly, the ability to embed images into a web page. So up to this point, if you'd wanted to look at an image in a web page, it would have been a link, and you'd have had to have clicked that link for it to open in a new window. Mosaic changed that. They made it so you could have images and text side by side within the page. Another, benef uh, another benefit of Mosaic was that it was worked across multiple platforms. So initially, it was written to work on Unix, but then they later expanded that to include Windows, Mac, and Amiga. And as a result, it um, was quickly adopted by uh, many people within the, primarily within the scientific community. And it often uh, gets dubbed the first uh, most popular browser as a result of this. Now, there was a, one of the core developers of Mosaic was a guy called Mark Andreessen. Now, he was a student at the University of Illinois, and he graduated in the summer of 93. He left his job at the NCSA and would move to California. Now it's here that he met a guy called Jim Clark, and Jim could see the commercial prospects of the Mosaic browser, and so the two of them founded a company called the Mosaic, Mosaic Communications Corporation, and they set about developing a new browser, which they codenamed Mozilla, as in Mosaic Killer. Now, the University of Illinois weren't very happy with them using the name Mosaic, and so they had to rebrand and so they became Netscape Communications Corporation. And by the end of 1994, they released the first version of their browser, which they called Netscape Navigator. <coughs> now, uh, Netscape was, um, quickly became a popular browser. Um, one of its big bonuses over Mosaic was that it was able to start rendering the page before it finished downloading. So at the time, internet speeds were very slow um, for the majority of people. 
So you didn't really want to have to wait for everything to download, including all the images that had started to be embedded, thanks to Mosaic. Um, so Netscape allowed you to start reading um, the content while the images were still downloading. Um, as I say, internet connections were very slow, so if you wanted a copy of Navigator, you were pretty unlikely to go and download a copy from the internet as you would these days. Um, so one of the ways Navigator distributed it was by making deals with various internet service providers um, who would provide the installation files when you signed up to them. And also, at the time, it was very um, common for people to go out to their local bookshop and buy a copy of an internet starter kit which would be a book that would often come with a floppy disk um, containing the installation files for Navigator. So early versions of Netscape Navigator with the installation file would fit on a single floppy disk. If you were to try and compare that to, say, Chrome today, it would be well over 50 floppy disks for the installation files. So it quickly overtook Mosaic and became the most popular browser. Now, at the same time that Mark and Jim were developing Net um, Netscape Navigator, Spyglass Inc., who were an offshoot of the, um, universe, uh, the NTSA at the University of Illinois, they were trying to um, also commercialize Mosaic, and so they were licensing um, the code base of their version of the Mosaic browser. Now, a number of different companies um, bought into this and, and signed up for licenses, but probably the most important and most well known will be Microsoft who in 1995 released Internet Explorer, which was based on the Mosaic code base that they had licensed from Spyglass. Now, one of the things that Microsoft were quick to do was to make Internet Explorer freely available to all Windows users. Now, this is really important because Netscape Navigator was only free to use if you were non-profit, i.e. was free to anyone on Windows, whether you were making profit or not. And by 96, and this sometimes surprises people, but they also had released IE for both Mac and Unix. It was actually cross-platform in the early days, although they weren't necessarily exactly the same application. So this takes us to what is commonly referred to as the start of the browser war. Um, and this is basically the two big corporations, Microsoft and Navigate, uh, Netscape, competing against one another to try and gain dominance in the browser market. Now, in 1996, Netscape Navigator accounted for four in five browsers out there. Microsoft <coughs> was very keen to change this. So we had a period where we have these two competing corporations developing two different browsers and are kind of going in different directions, which could be very frustrating. So for example, Netscape gave us the blink tag, meanwhile IE gave us marquee. And similarly, um, in the CSS had just uh, come onto the scene and IE were quick to adopt that. Um, in, I think it was Internet Explorer 3 that was first to start supporting CSS. They were quite early into the game. Meanwhile, Netscape decided they'd do something different. They went with something called JavaScript style sheets. Never took off, they're the only ones who ever used it. Um, but basically, because you have these two browsers going in different directions, a lot of websites would work in one and not the other. And so it was very common to see websites with a badge saying, this site works best in Navigator, or this site works best in IE. So, in general, IE was seen as inferior to Navigator, but things started to change um, as Microsoft started to take it seriously and really plow money into developing their browser. In 1997, Internet Explorer 4 was released. Now, at the release party for this in the October of 97, they arranged for a 10 foot tall letter E um, to be at the party. And somehow, by the end of the evening, it had found its way onto the lawn of Netscape with the sign from the IE team, we love you. The next day, Netscape employees discovered this and were quick to knock it down. They replaced it with their mascot, the Mozilla dinosaur, and a new sign that read Netscape 72, Microsoft 18. This was the market share of the two um, brow browsers at the time. Unfortunately for Netscape, this version of IE was a bit of a game changer. So I've mentioned that uh, Microsoft have licensed the code base from Spyglass, so they're using this uh, version of Mosaic for their code. 
One of the agreements was that they would pay Spyglass a minimum quarterly fee, and on top of that, they would pay a percentage of the revenues being made from the browser. Now, Spyglass weren't receiving this percentage of the revenue because Microsoft claimed there was none because they were giving it away for free. Spyglass weren't happy with this. They threatened with a contractual audit, and eventually, Microsoft would... Um, there was a settlement made and Microsoft gave Spyglass $8 million and they switched away from using the Mosaic code base and to using Trident, their in-house rendering engine. And this rendering engine would stay with IE until its final version. So as the 90s progress, we start to see um, another change in that Microsoft start bundling Explorer with Windows. So up to now, if you wanted a copy of Windows Explorer, you would have had to have gone and obtained a copy much like you would with Navigator. But this started to change around now, and Microsoft started actually putting it as part of the Windows um, operating system. So its adoption became uh, started to spread more rapidly. Also around this time, Explorer started to become faster and more stable than Navigator. We start to see the use of tables for layouts to make more interesting websites. And this is something that Navigator really doesn't do very well, well at rendering. It starts to crash and freeze, considering you're on slow dial-up uh, connections and paying for your data, this is less than ideal. And so people start migrating away and over to Explorer. So by 1998, the United States government takes on Microsoft in an antitrust lawsuit. The US government claiming that Microsoft is using their monopoly on the personal computing market to push out um, rivals in the software industry, and in particular, um, Netscape. This uh, lawsuit would go on for a number of years. Eventually, um, it was agreed that Microsoft would have to be broken up into smaller companies to uh, deal with the situation. Of course, Microsoft appealed, and it was eventually agreed by 2001 that they would give third parties access to their APIs, and that would be um, how they would deal with things. This was a little bit too late, though, for Nav uh, Netscape Navigator and others <coughs> out there. By 2001, 9 in 10 browsers are now using Internet Explorer. It's this year that Microsoft released Internet Explorer 6, the browser that everyone loves to hate. Um, one of the problems with Internet Explorer 6 was that it become, um, not only would it become the most dominant browser, but it would be the last major release of Internet Explorer for five years. So this kind of stifled innovation, because if you wanted to build a web page for the majority of people, you'd build it to work in IE6, not Navigator. And it uh, didn't matter what the browsers were doing to bring in new, com new ideas and advance the web, you had to support IE6 for uh, people to be able to use your site. So this really marks the end of an era. Netscape have lost the war to Microsoft. In 1998, AOL bought Netscape, and they would continue development of the Navigator browser for about 10, 10 more years. But they were never able to regain the um, share of the market that they'd lost, and in the end, they just gave up. But it's important not to forget the many things that Netscape and Navigator gave us, including JavaScript, animated GIFs, and cookies, all things that are a fundamental part of today's modern web. So the wars come to an end, but something's changing now. This, this is a new beginning for um, web browsers because not only did Netscape um, sell to AOL in 98, they also open sourced much of their code base, <coughs> including the Gecko rendering engine that they've been working on um, behind the scenes. So Gecko was a new rendering engine that was meant to replace the existing one in Navigator, but it never got incorporated into their browser. Mozilla was founded as, um, to act as guardian over this code base. And this really marks the start of what becomes the open web ecosystem that we're familiar with today. So the internet has been um, navigated, the, the web has been navigated, it's been explored, 
and in 2000, it was conquered by KDE for Linux. So Conquer was a web browser that was made for Linux by KDE, and it's the first browser I've talked about so far that was open source from the beginning. So it was built from the ground up with virtually no corporate backing. And you're probably wondering why I'm mentioning Conquer, because I suspect the majority of people in here have either never heard of it, or at least never used it. But it's hugely important in the story of the browser, because Apple at the time were looking around for ways to replace Internet Explorer from their OS. Now, many people thought that they would turn to Mozilla for a solution, but Conquer caught their attention because its open source KHTML rendering engine and KJS, which was its JavaScript engine, um, they, they were more standard compliant than either Navigator and Internet Explorer. And they really liked the clean code base that was made available through uh, KHTML. So by 2003, Apple announced to the world that they were releasing Safari, their new web browser that used the WebKit rendering engine. And WebKit is a fork of KHTML. So they'd quietly forked the KHTML um, repositories a few years before, and they'd been developing it so it would work with their, their setup and how they wanted it. Now, when they released Safari, they also wrote back to the developers of Conqueror, and in their letter, they praised them for their clean code base and standards compliance, and said that they were going to contribute back the modifications and improvements they've made as part of WebKit. So this would go on for a bit of them collaborating and trying to um, feed the stuff back. But unfortunately, when you fork something in a few years past, it becomes very difficult um, for those changes to go back up the stream. So eventually, um, they called it a day, and Conqueror switched to work it as well. So this leads me to what some people refer to as the next browser wall. I put a question mark here because I'm not sure I'm completely sold on the idea it was another browser wall because Internet Explorer was dominant, but it wasn't really doing very much to pick up a fight with everyone. And I feel like it was more just a, a case of there was a lot of healthy competition going on. So I've already mentioned that Mozilla's been set up um, and they're using the code base that has been given to them by um, Netscape. And by 2004, they released the Firefox web browser that uses the Gecko rendering engine that they had acquired from Netscape. Now, they had actually released versions of their browser the year before. Um, some people may remember that there was a release called Phoenix. Unfortunately, Phoenix Technologies in the state weren't very happy with them using their, their name, and so threatened a lawsuit, and so they quickly changed it, and so it became Firebird. Unfortunately, this name was also taken, this time by another open source project. So eventually, they switched to Firefox, which they set it on because they liked it as being unique and quirky. And so we get Firefox in 2004. Now, obviously, they didn't have the um, financial might of Microsoft behind them, um, so they needed a way of sort of spreading the words. They launched a marketing campaign that went on for quite a while called Spread Firefox. Um, they did a number of um, things to try and pull people in, uh, including arranging for, they crowdfunded a two-page ad in the New York Times, which featured, I think it was about 100,000 names of the people that backed that advert were all featured on this advert. Um, and they did a number of other things as part of that. Um, they did a world, went for a world record for the most downloaded app, software application in 24 hours. Um, but by the first year, end of the first year, they'd hit 100 million downloads um, but the things we've got Firefox to thank for, they popularised tab browsing, although technically the Opera browser would kind of introduce this concept a bit before this, but it was, it was really Firefox that um, got it out to the masses. Uh, and also um, Firebug, which we have to thank for the web developer tools that we now just come to expect as part of the modern web browser. So by 2006, 85% of people are still using Internet Explorer. Microsoft still dominate. However, Firefox now accounts for about 10%. But it's been five years since Internet Explorer 6 came out, 
So Microsoft decided it's about time they released the new version, so we get IE7. Now this is an attempt for them to try and um, modernize their standards and introduce some of the features that become common in their rivals, things like tabs and search as part of their toolbar. However, it's still a bit inferior compared to the other options out there. And unfortunately for Microsoft, a new rival is about to appear on the scene because in 2006, Google released Chrome. Now to start with, Eric Schmidt, the CEO, CEO of Google, was originally opposed to the idea of a Google browser. He had witnessed the fiercely fought out battle between Microsoft and Netscape in the first browser war, and he believed that Google was too small and too young a company to <coughs> mess up in it. It could, have, it could have just sunk their company. However, co-founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page had hired some Mozilla developers, and they had been quietly working away on the uh, concept for a new web browser. And when they showed it to Eric Schmidt, his response was, it was so good that it essentially forced me to change my mind. And so through a 38 page comic book, they announced to the world Google Chrome. And amongst these pages, they, they praise the open source community, in particular Mozilla and WebKit. And so it should come as little surprise that they also released Chromium this year, which is the open source browser that Chrome is built upon. And this uses the WebKit rendering engine that Apple gave us that they had fought from KHTML back all those years before. So by 2013, over a third of browsers are now Google Chrome. And Internet Explorer has fallen from being nine in 10 browsers uh, at the start of um, the 2000s to just below a quarter. And Firefox has increased its share as well as Safari to 17% and 11% respectively. Now, the reason I mentioned uh, why I'm bringing up 2013 is this is a significant year because this is when Google decided to fork WebKit as Blink. Now, they're getting along fine with Apple, but they're kind of needing to go in different directions and things are kind of beginning to slow down with the development of WebKit as a result of um, the two directions they're going in. And so they create Blink. And we see a number of uh, browsers start to um, get developed off of Chromium now. So Opera, who have been around since 1996, and they've been using their own rendering engine called Presto, in 2013, they announced they were going with WebKit and then quickly changed their minds when Google announced what they were doing and said, we're actually going with Blink. So Opera became um, based off of the Blink uh, and Chromium browser. And we start to see other browsers forming. So there's Brave, which is a, a privacy conscious uh, browser. Samsung Internet, for anyone who uses a Galaxy phone, that's the default browser on there. And Vivaldi, which comes from um, that some of the original developers are apart from. By 2013, Microsoft have realized that Internet Explorer is just going nowhere. They need to kind of change their image a bit. Um, and so they release Edge. Now, Edge is an opportunity for them to try and really modernize their browser. So they change the rendering engine from Trident to Edge HTML. Now, Edge HTML is actually a fork of the Trident rendering engine, but it's an opportunity for them to remove a lot of the deprecated code and really modernize it and um, get the web standards up to, uh, the, to be on par with their rivals. Um, in fairness, they don't do a bad job of it. However, it turns out it's really hard for them to maintain that and, and keep it in the game. And so last year, they made the announcement that my, uh, they were building a new Edge browser that was going to be based on Chromium, and they will be replacing Edge HTML with the Blink rendering engine. Now, it might have come as a surprise to some, but Edge was already using Chromium on Android. Um, and if you're one of the shareholders of Microsoft, you're probably a bit conscious of the amount of money being sunk into your this web browser. This kind of uh, should make them a bit happier, because a lot of the work's been done elsewhere, but they can still maintain having their own uh, browser on their operating system 
So if we look back over the last 10 years, you can see a real shift in the way that the browser and markets have gone. So we start off with Internet Explorer being really dominant in the early 2000s, but by 2018, Chrome have really overtaken them. So whereas in the early days, IE used, Microsoft used their dominant position in the personal computing markets to kind of really push Internet Explorer, Google used their dominant position of being an online platform of really pushing the Google Chrome browser. And you can also see that Firefox have really sort of lost out a bit. And then we have a rise in the number of people using Safari, probably explained by the fact that we've now got the arrival of smartphones. And anyone that uses an iPhone, it doesn't matter which browser you're using, it's just a wrapper around Safari. That is a um, restriction applied um, by Apple on anyone wanting to develop a browser on their platform. That's different on Android. If you use Firefox on Android, it is still Firefox. It uses the Gecko rendering engine. Google are a bit more flexible on this front. So this brings us to the future. Where do we go from here? Well, if there's one thing we know from history, it has a tendency to repeat itself. So whereas in the early 90s, you had a dominant Mosaic browser that was then um, replaced by a dominant Netscape during the mid to late 90s, and then the early 2000s, we saw a dominant Internet Explorer. It now looks like we're heading towards Google Chrome becoming the dominant browser. It's continuing to increase its market share. We're not really seeing much of a, a, a there's not really much slowdown or obvious sign of any decline at the moment. So the question is, is it becoming the new Internet Explorer? Um, it's very debatable that. Um, I'm not really going to go into it, but in, there are beginning to be signs that some web pages are being built that only work on Chrome, which then kind of isolates some of the competitors. And admittedly, some of those websites are coming out of Google themselves, which seems uh, slightly dodgy. Um, but then there's also this complexity in there that Chromium is open source, whereas IE, Netscape, and Mosaic, they weren't. So there's lots of people contributing to this code base, including the likes of Microsoft now. And even though they don't use it, um, Mozilla actually contributes sometimes to the Chromium project. Um, but as far as I'm aware, Google still control what actually goes in there. And I put this quote up here from Steve Jobs. Um, and he said in 2004, What's the point of focusing on making the product even better when the only company you can take business from is yourself? And I feel like this really describes well where Microsoft were in the two, early 2000s. They dominated, they didn't really need to innovate or add anything to Internet Explorer. They just knew people were going to use them. And we could be heading towards that with Google Chrome um, because as its share increases, they might, there might be less inclination for them to really push things forward and invest lots of developer time into the browser. So I'm going to finish with this, um, this quote. Um, this is from Adam Barr, who was the Chromium software engineer um, at the time that Blink was announced to the world in 2013. And he, he, he wrote, we believe that having multiple rendering engines, similar to having multiple browsers, will spur innovation and over time improve the health of the entire open web ecosystem. I feel this is really important as web developers um, or people that work within this web industry. <coughs> it's our responsibility, our duty to ensure that we support as many browsers as is feasible. We don't just put all our attention on Google Chrome. We need to be conscious of the whole eco web, uh, web ecosystem and try and protect the diversity of the browsers and rendering engines that we have today. And so if Google Chrome is your default browser, there's no harm in that, got no issue with that. But I recommend that you go and try some of the alternatives out there because you might find that one of the other browsers better, better suits your particular requirements because there's a lot of browsers out there all doing their own thing. And yeah, it would be good to not not become so reliant on Google that it ends up dominating and we find ourselves back in the position we were.
about 20 years ago with the dominant internet explorer and innovation slowing. So, thank you. Andy. Um